Welcome to the Wednesday Morning Roundtable. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Stephanie Hutchinson and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today's topic will be workforce development. We have two presenters with us today, Dr. Keiko Kimura and Kelly King. Dr. Keiko Kimura currently serves as the Vice President for Workforce Development and Partnerships at Cayuga Community College. In her role, she provides leadership and oversight for the college's workforce training programs, institutional research and assessment, and represents Cayuga in its efforts to become an effective partner in the regional workforce ecosystem. She's a member of the Workforce Board in both Cayuga Cortland and Oswego counties and is the chair of Oswego's Partners Roundtable Subcommittee. She has worked in education for almost 30 years, primarily in higher education, but also at the K-12 level in Japan, Chile, and the US. Her first job was to deliver newspapers in her hometown of Ontario, Canada, where she learned the value of showing up on time and getting the job done even on the snowiest of days. Keiko holds a bachelor's degree from McGill University, a master's degree from the Teachers College at Columbia University, and an education doctorate from Northern Illinois University. Kelly King has proudly served the community in Cuga County for over two decades in roles ranging from assisting individuals battling drug and alcohol addiction to providing job coaching and job development to those with developmental disabilities and mental illness. Today, Kelly serves as the director of Cayuga County's Employment and Training Department, overseeing the various programs and operations for the Cayuga Work Center. Kelly regularly collaborates with the New York State Department of Labor, New York State Education, and Human Services Agencies to strengthen the public workforce system and address the needs of job seekers and employers in the community. She's a Leadership Cayuga alumna, a member of the local business services team, plays a role in the Joint Advisory Committee for Cayuga Onondaga BOCES, and is the Trade Act Coordinator for both Cayuga and Cortland counties. Kelly holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Cayuga College. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie, for the uh, fine introduction. Um, so I, I, I know I'm scheduled to um, talk about uh, the facilities efforts that uh, the college has undertaken to support workforce development, namely the development of our Culinary Institute here in downtown Auburn, as well as the Advanced Manufacturing Institute on our Fulton campus in Oswego County, and the redevelopment of our Cornell Cooperative Extension Center on Grant Avenue. And I will certainly uh, discuss those projects, but I also want to emphasize that they, these projects um, are more than just capital construction projects, although that is certainly, um, those are certainly um, very important uh, efforts on their own, but they're also physical representations of uh, the college's strategic efforts under the direction of our president, Dr. Durant, to really demonstrate um, a community commitment to collaborative building um, with the goal of making a direct impact on the economic prosperity of the county, the county that we serve. And specifically, I would say, these opportunities represent the college's desire and commitment to work closely with public and private entities um, in developing the next generation of well-educated, gainfully employed, um, critical thinkers and citizens. So how might we do that, you know, given the major disruptions that we've experienced over the past two years, beginning with the COVID-19 pandemic and the 
subsequent health-related closures. Um, those things have certainly impacted all dimensions of our lives, from social to the economic to the educational realms. And for us in higher ed, our suppositions about higher education have certainly been turned on their heads. Um, and, and so as, as educators and as an employer and also um, a strong partner with state agencies, we had and certainly continue to have this obligation to really carefully consider the recovery process and to um, ensure that we are planning and preparing our students, our employees, our clients to be best prepared for participating in that recovery process. So I thought I would start by sharing um, just a little context in terms of the state of our national workforce systems right now with some labor data that I find interesting. Um, so we all know that 2020 is really going to be stuck in our minds as a time that really wreaked havoc on our um, employment. Right? More than 20 million people lost their jobs. However, we now know that 2021 is considered a time of you know, pretty strong labor market recovery. Um, so much so that we now observe employers really experiencing severe difficulty in finding suitable candidates. The country as a whole has been adding about 550,000 jobs a month. So this sudden reversal from lows to highs has really um, had employers scrambling to find those uh, candidates, compete for more workers. They offer enticements like um, increased wages, uh, cash bo signing bonuses, and any other benefit they can think of to secure talent. Um, and this in turn has created um, the most worker-friendly job market that we have seen in decades. And the workforce is certainly aware of that, right? At least four million people have left their work um, over the past uh, the last six months of 2021, with many of them departing to find better pay, better benefits, more flexible schedules, etc. So all this to say that in the workforce development world, we are experiencing this friction, right, of what has been called uh, the many-to-many -many problem. We have many unfilled jobs and millions of people separating from employment and although many of those jobs that were lost at the height of the pandemic were considered um, frontline service jobs, they didn't necessarily require a higher uh, a formal college education, they didn't necessarily translate to high wages, there are still millions of positions that require high skills and earn high wages that employers are still struggling to fill. So what are we to do with that information? Well. As a community college, we are uniquely positioned to address that friction, to reduce it, both for the candidate or the uh, student on one side, as well as the employer on the other side, by bridging the education to employment gap with flexible training that emphasizes skill building in short formats that lead to entry-level jobs with sustainable wages. Community colleges as a whole serve about 11 million individuals every year, and we are the only entities that have the scope and the reach to provide that job-focused training that is needed right now. And that is an unbiased opinion. <laughs> so, you know, over the years, I would say, um, and perhaps even under the radar, Cayuga Community College has been steadily growing our workforce development programs, providing workers with new skills, enticing job seekers with um, new fields through entry-level programs in tandem with uh, in local industry. We've been developing and delivering job-specific classes for local employers, 
and even helping economic developers in their efforts to attract prospective new investment through national credentialing. Courses that we offer range, you know, it, it's a huge range. We, we offer blueprint reading, precision measurement. We offer courses in DevOps, Kaizen, Lean Manufacturing, Microsoft Excel, new supervisor training, the list could, you know, it goes on and on. Um, importantly, these training courses are not tied to a traditional semester or credit hours. They can be offered in formats that suit the employer or the learner online in the evenings over the course of three days or three months. This type of flexibility, we think, is the key to addressing what is needed now, which is essentially somewhat of a reset of our, um, how we view post-secondary education as a, um, an all-you-can-eat model and, and converting that to more of a eat-it-while-I-need-it model, right? Um, more than ever, I would say, we think that these formats and, formats and these types of trainings are exactly what is needed for the job seeker post-pandemic. Someone who may or may not have a degree, um, but they're looking for some way to upskill and to advance quickly. We think this approach also has broader application even beyond this group of job seekers. These delivery options are also suitable for the younger individual, someone who cannot commit to a full-time program of study, um, or they can't imagine committing themselves to two years or four years of study before they get a job because they want or they need to be working, or they have a family that they need to um, balance responsibilities, and they need that additional training in order to make themselves marketable. So let's talk a little bit now about uh, the capital investments that the college has made to illustrate uh, this type of work in action. And I'll go in uh, reverse order in terms of development from projects that are more in the in development phase to the ones that are um, completed and up and running. So we'll begin, I'll begin with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Center on Grant Ave. So this is a two-story, 19,000 square foot facility that uh, is the future home of the Workforce Development Center. Um, the center will house the college's community, con community education and workforce development programs and services. So those include many of the things I described earlier. Career pathway entry level programs, corporate training, apprenticeship, short term industry training, as well as um, professional development programs. Exactly the kind of training that um, is needed for the learner of today. The facility is also scheduled to house uh, the Cayuga Works Career Center, the services of which you're going to hear more about from, from Ms. King shortly. Um, partnered agencies here will work together to provide quality services um, through partnerships with Cayuga Employment and Training, New York State Department of Labor, Cayuga on Cayuga Onondaga BOCES, Access VR, and many more. In addition, Cayuga County's Cornell Cooperative Extension will also maintain offices here, continuing their work to strengthen New York families and communities through uh, nutrition education, health, and the promotion of environmental and social resilience. So the key to success to this endeavor specifically is really the willingness of critical agencies to support one another in contributing to a vibrant workforce ecosystem by carefully bringing together partner resources into one facility we can leverage the strengths of individual expertise and funding streams to collectively improve economic outcomes through collaborative career training, financial technical literacy services, and work readiness programs. I mentioned earlier this friction between um, jobs, job openings, and job seekers, and the college is endeavoring to address this gap by serving to uh, by serving the job seeker or the student. By having a centralized location, we can reduce that friction for the candidate by employing the kinds of strategies we know are critical to getting people the training they need 
to get them the job that they're looking for. One of the high impact practices we are implementing is to blur the line between non-credit workforce and credit training, such as our certificate in substance abuse counseling certificate, our um, medical coding specialist training. These are the types of certifications that can serve as effective on-ramps to credit level of study in human services and in healthcare related fields, but in and of themselves, they, can, they are also tickets to gainful employment. The friction on the employer side can also be alleviated by providing a single collaborative resource for employer services, such as recruitment, training, um, access to apprenticeship resources and funding, and um, certainly job training. Um, all right, next I just want to spend a little time talking about the Fulton uh, Advanced Manufacturing Institute. So for many years now, the New York State Department of Labor has, list, Department of Labor has listed uh, advanced manufacturing as one of the significant industries in the central New York region. And this is evidenced certainly by the booming economic growth of companies around us today. Um, Manufacturing certainly took a hit in the first decade of the 2000s, but with the advent of um, digital processing, advanced materials, um, new paradigms in um, assistive robotics, for example, we have seen the rise in production and processing in this region, and with that, a significant increase in demand for trained professionals in this field. So our approach to embarking on this project is really an exemplar of the types of relationships higher education entities really need to have with uh, private industry. Specifically uh, for the college, we have assembled a countywide advanced manufacturing consortium, um, which is a 20 plus member group representing uh, local employers, workforce system partners, and economic developers who are committed to making this facility a reality. The vision for this facility is not only to provide training for traditional age college students who are looking for um, career training in uh, industrial and electrical technology, but the, the site will also serve as a uh, a space for private enterprise to house training opportunities that they need to train their incumbent workers. Contributions from our partners have included not only um, cash dollars to support the construction of the facility, but also extend to um, consultation on the design and layout of the facility itself, um, input on our curriculum design, particularly on in our short-term training programs, um, I would say that the nature of this relationship has really gone beyond the sort of typical once a year participation on an advisory committee. The relationship is much more intrusive and this has served us very well because we now have uh, direct access to the kinds of information that we need to ensure that our programs are relevant and flexible. So we are receiving the benefit of advice on our curriculum. Um, they also refer students to our programs. They refer potential trainers to be part of our um, uh, in, uh, teaching force. And most importantly, they tell us about the jobs that they see coming in the future and the ways in which we, we should be ready to prepare for that. So I'm happy to say that we will be holding a, a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Advanced Manufacturing Institute in early May. And we look forward to contributing to the training and upskilling of many, many individuals to enter the field of industrial and electrical technology. Um, in another realm of workforce preparation training, we have our beautiful Culinary Institute uh, on Grant Avenue, or sorry, on uh, Genesee Street. And this is another example of the close collaborative partnerships with private and with private industry and public opportunities that the college has 
been able to secure, this time in the hospitality sector. We have a rising interest in culinary and food service management that the Finger Lakes, as we all know, is, is currently enjoying, combined with New York's downtown revitalization initiatives. Add to that a successful business owner who's looking to build on his legacy to support uh, workforce training uh, in this field of study. So to capitalize on this energy, the college was uh, awarded $850,000 through the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, and in combination with other generous donations, we were able to build this beautiful teaching facility in downtown Auburn. The Institute also represents a step uh, in a culinary career pathway that segues beautifully from the very strong culinary arts program at our Cayuga Onondaga BOCES. And this allows BOCES graduates to step into our two-year AAS program with some college credit already under their belts. From there, there are a host of careers that are available to them that students can get trained in, from restaurant to research and development chefs, caterers, food service managers, business owners, etc. This facility also hosts um, cookery lessons for those who are interested in sort of brushing up on their home cooking skills. Uh, we also provide opportunities for people to learn more about the Finger Lakes farm to table movement and uh, chances to get in on sampling some of the excellent county craft brewing uh, retailers. So we will shortly be releasing our spring summer schedule of offerings and we look forward to seeing you there at the Institute. I advise you to um, act quickly though to register because we have, uh, uh, I would say, a frequent flyer list of, of uh, students who like to um, participate in those events and seating is limited. So all three of these projects, I hope, um, give you a sense of the college's commitment to supporting economic vitality in the region. I, I will close out by saying that we believe uh, these efforts and the strategies that we are employing are certainly sustainable for a few reasons. One is that we have applied the strategy of prizing collaboration over competition in the workforce realm by joining forces with other community colleges and other educational institutions to go after some federal and state level sponsored projects, making our uh, applications much more competitive. We're also thrilled by a couple of big news items, one of which is the governor's um, recent announcement of $350 million that will be devoted to workforce development and finally, um, we have learned that we will soon have funding to support credit and non-credit micro-credentials through the New York State Training Assistance Program, or TAP, as it's commonly called. This is a major source of state financial assistance in higher ed for many college students. So previous to this news, micro-credentials, which are defined as uh, short, focused credentials designed to provide in-demand skills have been exempt from state and financial assistance packages as standalones, but that has changed with respect to TAP, which is great news, particularly because Cayuga already has um, 22 micro-credentials in areas such as education, advanced manufacturing, information technology, business and event planning, accounting. Um, so, you know, we look forward to promoting these short-term portable credentials with the added bonus of their being financially supported by the state. So I hope that uh, what I've shared today has given you some idea of the college's work in the workforce development realm. Um, thank you so much for being an attentive audience. Um, I think um, that concludes my remarks for now. Thank you. I'll pass the mic over to Kelly King. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. 
Thank you, Keiko. She did an excellent job. Hard to follow Keiko now. Um, no pressure. So I want to start out by uh, introducing myself. Again, my name is Kelly King, and I, um, I started this role as the Director of Employment and Training about six months into the pandemic. So uh, Employment and Training has been the department that I've worked in for um, going on 20 years. I was an employment and training specialist. I started in 2003 when our career center opened its doors. So prior to 2003, uh, we had multiple agencies throughout the community. Um, and employment and training was actually in the old historic um, post office. And various agencies came together to acquire funding to create a one-stop center and become certified as a national one-stop center. And we uh, moved into the space at Cuga Community College in 2003, um, which was the year that I started. So I always like to tell people I feel like I grew up at the Career Center because I have been there almost 20 years since the day we opened our doors. Um, and always wanted to have more of a leadership role within the center. So um, I'm going on my second year as the director of county employment and training. And, and as I said, I started six months into the pandemic, which was um, a challenge for myself to, you know, to lead the team when all of a sudden um, we're not there or, you know, I have staff um, working from home and furlough. So I think that I have a great appreciation to what employers went through with the change because I was also going through a change myself in my career. Um, so that's a little bit of background of how I, how I entered into this role. Um, when they developed the Career Center, the theory was let's bring all of the workforce development services and agencies together under one roof to essentially provide a seamless service to the community. Um, when we moved in, we partnered with the New York State Department of Labor on site. We had Unity Employment, Seneca Cuga ARC, Access VR, um, and of course, Cuga County Employment and Training. So the idea was when the job seeker entered in, the services were seamless and they didn't know who was providing the service. Previously, you would have someone going to Grand Ave to apply for unemployment and um, report their job search. But then they're coming to employment and training for workshop development or career counseling and guidance. Um, and then to access, if you had a disability and you were going to go through Access VR, you would then have to make another stop. And, and that's hard enough with transportation and time management, especially for the people that we serve. So, Coming together um, as a unit really helped serve the community and the job seekers and businesses in a much more efficient way. Um, I'm really excited about the workforce development building, as Keiko discussed and mentioned. Um, it's kind of taking what we have and building it and making it even stronger, and this is definitely the time to focus on that because we're rebuilding workforce and we're essentially rebuilding businesses in the community. Um, moving to the Workforce Development Center together, I think, is only going to enhance those opportunities for us as service providers and educators, for job seekers, for businesses. Um, it's going to strengthen all of those things, which is our goal, is to strengthen the, the workforce um, system. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, trends in the labor market. So I have some views from before COVID to during COVID, and I don't want to say post-pandemic because we're not quite there yet, um, but the biggest trend that I see that isn't a surprise to anybody is the work worker shortage, right? So everybody says, well, what's the biggest trend? What's the biggest complication in workforce? And it truly locally, globally, is the shortage of, work, of workers. Um, the number of job openings exceeds the number of hires every single day. Uh, if I look back to when I started my career, it was job seeker heavy, right? So we provide job seeker and business services. Very seldom did the business reach out to us 
Um, it was the job seeker, stacks of resumes going out to the same employers. We would give the same referrals to the job seekers for they were competing for very few jobs because you know, the, there weren't that many jobs and there were a lot of job seekers. Now, the employer is the seeker. So I'm seeing that as the change in trend. It's flipped. The employer is coming to us and saying, we need job seekers. Where are the job seekers? And they want the magic answer. Where are they? Bring them to me. And I wish that I could. Um, that's my biggest challenge. Where are the job seekers? Right? Where, where are they? So I think in the beginning, um, early on in the, in the pandemic, you know, the, the, the buzz was all about, well, they're all collecting unemployment. You know, they're on extended benefits. Why, are they, why would they look for work? Everybody's just collecting unemployment. No one will go back to work if we keep extending their unemployment insurance benefits, right? I probably said the same thing in the beginning of the pandemic. Well, I can say that extended unemployment had ended, has ended in September. We're seven months into to, to that being gone. And we're still facing the crisis of where are the job seekers. It's not that they're home collecting unemployment or stimulus checks. It's truly a bigger complication and, and challenge for job seekers. Um, looking at the customers that we serve through employment counseling, um, and just through our customers coming through, uh, I think that the reason, and I can't, you know, my, my perspective is that, number one, there were a lot of early retirements um, with COVID, right? So, I mean, I, I, know, I know many people that, I, I, one in particular, she was an RN, loved her job, um, could retire, but chose not to, you know. Um, she had started to see what was going on with COVID, and she decided it was time to retire. And I think that that happened across the board, whether in, in not sector industry specific. I think that those that could retire or were offered an early retirement exited the workforce. So we had that crisis. We had a, a large number of baby boomers and folks that were um, working that chose to not anymore and not reenter because of retirement. Um, second, reason i think that people voluntarily quit their jobs so many people had to quit their jobs why i mean there were people that had been furloughed and laid off and companies unfortunately closed and downsized but you have people that voluntarily left their employment because of care responsibilities pressure due to the staffing shortages i mean when there's staffing shortages i saw it in my own office um, it puts pressure on the people that are there, and it creates a lot of stress, and some people just, they couldn't, couldn't continue with the pressures. Um, schools closed, kids were working remotely, some parents didn't have a choice. So the biggest thing that I saw, well, employers didn't want to change the way they did business, but the job seeker and employees needed flexibility. So there was the friction there. Um, I need a flexible work schedule, my employer can't offer that, may, maybe because of the type of industry that it is. Um, I was fortunate enough with my um, situation to be home part of the time and work remote part of the time because I have had a child that was um, work learning remotely. If you work in manufacturing on a production line, a frontline worker, you don't have those luxuries and not everybody's lifestyle allowed for that. So I think we saw many people exiting, exiting their jobs voluntarily. That also um, put a hit and, and increased the, the worker shortage. Um, so, you know, I think that, I think that now, um, that, that quick answer of everybody soaking up unemployment, I think now people are realizing there is a much larger picture to that, or we would see more people back to work and less you know, less openings in there. As Keiko said, every day, every day there are job openings and, and nobody to fill those. Um, so every day, you know, when I, I talk to different businesses and they say, well, now, okay, so we know there's a shortage. We know that people, you know, there aren't, people aren't looking for work necessarily enough that we, you know, we can't capture them. What do we have to do? So 
what I do is, you know, I encourage thinking outside of the box and, and, and working differently, incentivizing um, people to work for you. Focus on retention as well as recruitment, right? So we're so busy trying to, to develop our workforce that we forget about the current workforce. How do we keep them? Increase wages, um, bonuses, and working on morale in the workplace. Those are our core fundamental things that we as employers should have been doing and do all along. We took it for granted because we had an abundant number of workers. Um, so I think that focusing on retention and recruitment differently. Uh, we definitely have been doing more on-site recruitments and job fair activities with employers in the community that, that the services that they hadn't really reached out for prior. Um, I think that that's, you know, that is definitely helping employers with job seekers, but they really needed to think outside of the box and how to entice them and how to retain the people that they have. Definitely an ongoing um, challenge, but you know, improving talent is another, is another thing. So the services that we provide at Employment and Training, we, uh, we operate under a grant, which is called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is all federal funds that allows us to retrain um, adults, dislocated workers, and youth. So that is really our mission, is to train and retrain uh, job seekers and community members, individuals, to essentially earn a living wage and be a qualified worker. So we have money to do that. We have money to help people go back to school, learn a new trade, earn their degree. Um, we have federal dollars to assist with that. So developing relationships with education um, institutions, with the local BOCES, short-term and long-term training programs, is something that we had to um, kind of up our game a little bit in terms of how do we do business differently? We had to do our business differently and, and start developing and strengthening our relationships with our providers so we can make appropriate referrals for job seekers to be retrained. Um, they may not be able to do the job they did before. They may be low skilled entry level and they want to improve their skills to earn a better wage. Living wages is the ultimate goal for the job seeker. Um, we also have on-the-job training dollars for employers. Uh, that's something that I, uh, I really see value in that program because it's a win-win. Uh, it's a wage subsidy to the employer. So the job seeker, if there's a gap in their skills, um, it gives the employer an incentive to hire them because we can reimburse the employer half of the hourly wage. So you don't have a lot to lose. You, you might do an interview and they're lacking X, Y, and Z, but they have great soft skills. And, and you can't teach soft skills. We, we, have, we try. I mean, we have workshops that offer soft skills training and job search training and job readiness. Um, but it's, you can teach somebody how to operate a, a CNC machine. You can teach somebody how to draw blood, but you can't always teach somebody how to have the right soft skills and personality and fit. So when an employer finds that, but they don't have all the skills, the, the hard skills, then we can write a contract and reimburse them while they're learning. Um, so if they're going to pay a, an individual $20 an hour, we can reimburse $10 an hour. So it's like, I'm getting them at half the cost, right? The job seeker got the job they might not have been able to get otherwise, and the employer has some um, subsidy and some offset some of their costs. Uh, that's a program that we offer that I, you know, I, I we hope to promote more because it, it truly is um, it truly is a win-win. So filling important skill gaps is huge in terms of workforce development on our end. Um, I think that employers appreciate that more now than ever because they are trying to fill their gaps you know, and we're trying to help bridge that. Um, we offer some youth programs. So I, I talk about the, the youth are the future workforce, right? And through our program, we have youth programming that allows us to hire a youth on as a Cuga County employee. We put them on our payroll. 
and we place them at work sites within the community. And we have um, 20, or 20 to 30 work sites that we have relationships with throughout Cayuga County, um, ranging anywhere from labor to clerical to activities aids, um, nursing home settings, school settings, retail settings, um, to essentially offer industry exposure to youth. Industry exposure is huge. Um, we're doing that now with our um, folks that we serve that are collecting public assistance that, that haven't been exposed necessarily to all of the industries that are out there, and the same thing with the youth. Um, and also for people that have only worked in one environment their entire life, they don't have the exposure. So with our youth program, we can get them job experience, work experience, paid work experience, um, which is very helpful to them and their families. Um, mentoring, job shadowing. So we're really investing in our youth right now uh, because they are our future workforce. And I think that Focusing on youth and education and training is huge, um, a huge key to the development of workforce in the future. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very proud of our youth program and, and where we're headed. Um, it's really grown over the years and especially within the last year, I would say, we've had more youth interaction and youth involvement in our programs than ever before. So that's, that's been great news for me, and I'm, I'm happy about that. That was one of my biggest goals taking on this role, was to, to really improve upon and strengthen the youth program. Um, I think that I'm in, in closing here, um, in lieu of time, I, just, I do want to say, I mentioned investment in terms of the youth. Um, if there's one thing I can say about how to strengthen the public workforce system is really an investment in more than just our youth, but investing in businesses, investing in services, investing in education and training. I think putting investment in all of those things is only going to strengthen the public workforce system um, and improve the quality of services and business within Cuga County and, and across the state you know, then globally, um, investing in what we have and strengthening that is only going to strengthen services. Um, so in that, I, will, I, and I would entertain any questions, and that concludes my um, portion for this morning. Thank you for having me. I haven't been out, and I've been in, presented in a couple of years, so this has been great to do an in-person event, so thank you. Great, thank you both um, for all of the wonderful information. Um, we will entertain questions at this time. Um, I have a question to start off. Um, could you, I, and I, perhaps this might be a, a, a question for Kelly, which industries within Cuyahoga County um, have been most acutely impacted by the worker shortage and have any industries benefited um, from the whole COVID experience? Excellent question. Um, I, I would say that home care agencies have, and, and health care agencies have probably faced the, the biggest challenge in terms of loss of staff from my experience. Um, one agency in particular that provides home care, uh, it, it was hard you know, from the pandemic for people to want to go into other people's homes and care for them, um, which is a challenging job without a pandemic going on. Um, and I think that they, they probably suffered the most from, from my experiences. I mean, I, I think that businesses, I don't think it's industry sector specific. Frankly, I think that all businesses hurt from, from this. I think that home care, health care probably suffered maybe the most. Um, in terms of benefit, I think that some, um, I think that some of the restaurant hospitality type uh, businesses, I would say, benefit in terms of learn to do their jobs differently 
and moving forward has allowed um, greater avenues for revenue uh, with you know the the food delivery and um, all of those things I think they'll continue to do that post pandemic and I think that's going to bring in a greater revenue than old style um, way of business so I think that I think there's been some positives for the for them, but I would say healthcare probably took the biggest brunt of it. And for Dr. Kimura, um, how do you generate interest? How do employers generate interest in advanced manufacturing work? Um, because it's not just when you hear about it, it doesn't seem like the most glamorous. Um, position and we know that students like you know are really driven by jobs that seem sexy and glamorous. So what are what are some of the strategies employed? You. Do we have any questions from the floor? Mr. Donovan? Yes, okay. Um, so we are quite fortunate um, with the current administration in that um, the college has uh, been the recipient of signif significant funding to support uh, wellness and mental health initiatives at the college. So we anticipate that um, along with those resources will be a, a need for us to, s to expand our services in some way. So you know, that is an opportunity for individuals who are training within 
those uh, job sectors to consider working alongside with us, particularly um, we will be targeting uh, agencies within the community that provide similar services where we can work together to collaborate on resources. I hope that answers your question. Did you say Access VR? Right. Yeah. Nope. Um, it, it was formerly known as VASID, right. right? Vocational Educational Services yeah. for Disability. Yep. Yeah. So now it's Access VR. Um, they are still up and running and funded. Um, they are in our office four out of the five days a week. So yep, yeah, it's still in operation. Yep, I agree. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes. So the question was, what is the time frame for the Workforce Development Center to come online? Well, um, the bid for the project itself is out currently, and the goal is really to um, identify uh, or, or you know, solidify a contract um, before the summer so that we can break ground on construction. Um, the latest estimate is it will take at least a year for that um, construction to take place and for um, all the entities to be able to be identified and moved into the facility. That's anticipated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, in terms of the shortage, uh, we we don't track, and I know at the division of, uh, in the New York State Department of Labor, Division of Labor and Statistics, probably tracks that a little bit more. Um, similar to the, into the aspect of underemployment, it's very hard to track that. Um, when you look at unemployment rates, when you, if you Google that or you look at the Department of Labor's website and you see unemployment rates, that's strictly based on people, recipients of unemployment insurance. Um, it doesn't actually touch on um, people that are just unemployed due to whether it be mental health, um, starting their own business, personal choice. Um, that's not factored in. So um, when, you, when you strictly look at the numbers, that's, that's unemployment insurance recipients. Um, I would say mental health is definitely uh, a factor in why some people are not working. I, would, I, I mean, we serve in our office a, a great number of people battling mental health issues, working with them um, to reenter the workforce and access services to be able to battle that. Um, so I agree, it is definitely, um, that definitely does impact the shortage. Uh, but in terms of tracking numbers, um, I, I don't know that that's something that's really done or able to be done. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, um, I would like to again thank Dr. Kamira and Mrs. King for presenting uh, today.
Um, and before you go, please remember to mark your calendars for our final program on Wednesday, May 18th, where we will welcome Kevin Swab, the new director of the Cuga County Veterans Services Agency, to share with us information on their programs, community outreach, and involvement. Thank you.